Well, thank you very much, Chris, for that uh, kind introduction. I didn't realize it's been 18 years since I've been on the Preserve Management Committee. My, how time flies, as well as it's been really fun watching the organization grow uh, and do the great things that, uh, that you do there. Um, so thanks for inviting me. Um, I, uh, um, tonight I'm gonna talk about, not a, I'm not gonna drill down very deeply into uh, particular insects or diseases, but rather I feel like uh, um, every once in a while, it's good to sort of step back and take a look at what's happened uh, and uh, uh, where we might be going. Uh, it helps us to evaluate, I think, uh, the potential threats as they pop up and uh, also potentially look at uh, uh, what things have been doing here for a long time and, and what they might continue to do. Or I, it's, it's like oftentimes I just end up scratching my head, um, but I have a lot of information uh, about that. So, um, you know, I think one of the most important things we need to look about when we think about um, uh, invasive species, uh, just bugs in forests are the invasive species. Those are the ones that are having the huge impact right now uh, in our forests. And, um, you know, the emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, Asian longhorn beetle, these are, these are some that are, are, are just recently, uh, relatively recently, uh, been introduced to the forest and uh, are proving to be game changers. Uh, really, uh, uh, you might want to call them ecosystem engineers or de-engineering or whatever, but they're having a huge impact. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, the, uh, uh, let me get this thing here. Um, you know, it's like, I mean, you, you know, you've got to contrast that with, with uh, native forest pests. I mean, when I was growing up and first starting grad school, um, we were looking at native pests. Uh, and I guess this dates me. Uh, we really hadn't really begun to, to focus on non-native invasives at the time. And so I grew up, you know, working on bark beetles that kill tree uh, conifers on the west and and I look at it like uh, uh, like they can actually be a beneficial part of the ecosystem because what they end up doing is taking out uh, uh, weakened individuals from a breeding population of trees and actually benefiting the population as a whole much like uh, as a lion would would take out uh, would would uh, better the population of say an antelopes uh, by taking the weak ones. Uh, the invasive non-native uh, pests though have become a huge problem. And um, you know, there are a number of reasons uh, surrounding this. Uh, you know, basically introduced insects, they encounter uh, new hosts, novel hosts with a novel chemistry. They're not co-evolved uh, uh, precisely with them. And it depends on how specific they are with the hosts that they feed on. Um, but with the no, with this, without a co-evolution of defenses by the host trees, all of a sudden they're being basically thrown into a situation where um, only the ones that, that might be resistant or in some way uh, be able to resist the attack of the uh, invadive, invader, uh, those are the ones that will survive. So there's gonna be sort of like a, you know, a huge uh, mortality event, not always, uh, but that, that's what we're seeing right now with some of these insects. Um, and so, uh, Oftentimes also the host range um, is too high uh, is for the insects is, is broad. And uh, 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 no, I'm sorry. So the host range of these insects can be broad to highly specific, um, but it's different from where they came. There's a different chemistry. Um, and I think one of the most important things um, is that when a pest is usually introduced, um, they leave their natural enemies behind. Um, they, you know, the natural enemies, it's rare for them to get introduced at the same time. And so this natural balance uh, that they're used to seeing is disrupted. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's interesting, we're, we're dealing with how do we predict what's going to happen? How do we sort of look at this, think of this, of what, what's going on? And oftentimes the environment in which they're introduced into is different from the place they came from. You know, it's not like, say, you know, it's like the temperate as opposed to the tropical, but you know, different temperate areas have, have different uh, uh, temperature regimes and, and moisture regimes. And so you know, when we think about 
how we work with this invasive insect, uh, oftentimes we just don't have comparables uh, that we can look at. Um, so it's it's you know it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the new environment, and this has been shown in many cases. So um, I, there we go. So I'm going to go through this long list, and I'm going to keep that long list there uh, when I talk about these insects because um, I just think it's really good to, to look. And we've been through a lot of insects that have invaded North America, um, in particular the Northeast, um, and you know they're still there. Some of them are bad, some of them aren't. And I'm going to start, of course, start with the spongy moth, which used to be called the gypsy moth. Um, so the spongy moth uh, was first introduced in 1869 by this uh, eccentric character uh, by the name of Etienne Lupeau uh, Trouvelot. And uh, Etienne Trouvelot was actually an artist, an astronomer, and also an amateur entomologist. And uh, there's been a lot of, you know, am, am, you know, in that day and age, you know, entomology wasn't really a profession. You know, it was just something that, that people did. You know, a lot of doctors, medical doctors were entomologists, um, but obviously also uh, this uh, uh, astronomer and artist was, was an amateur entomologist. And he decided uh, that he would uh, import of the chips, uh, the, sorry, I'm going to keep slipping, uh, the spongy moth uh, and breed it with the silk moth. And so he brought them into the Boston area in 1869. And needless to say, trying to keep an insect uh, penned up is a difficult project. And they were loose pretty quickly. And uh, the people re uh, realized that there was a huge problem. And they started eradication uh, in 1890. Um, this is just some of his some of his illustrations, which I find, you know, really phenomenal. Um, so the gypsy moth, I don't know if you all remember, uh, in the Finger Lakes in particular, it came through around the mid 80s and um, it took out a lot of trees. Uh, I remember I was working in a, in a couple of forests and some very large uh, uh, red oaks were killed uh, by repeated defoliation. I think from, what was that, 80, 86, 87 and 88. Um, but uh, the, you know, the interesting thing to me is that after it passed through, after that initial mortality event, um, it didn't really poke its head up uh, for a long, long time until just a couple of years ago. And so the, you know, this is a, a caterpillar. It comes out early in the spring. It feeds on the leaves, defoliates the trees, and they can oftentimes put up another flush of leaves. And so they can regain some of the strength that they lost by losing their leaves early in the season. Um, and so, the, it's been a chronic problem in Pennsylvania. Uh, year in and year out, they've, they've had a lot of management activity associated with it, a lot of uh, spraying of insecticides and, and uh, uh, biopesticides, Bacillus thuringiensis. And then just a couple of years ago, it reared its ugly head again in New York State. And, um, you know, I was always puzzling why uh, it was chronically infesting Pennsylvania and not in New York. And um, I'm still puzzled, to be very honest. I, I don't really get it. I don't see any circumstances that really stand out in my mind as to what would bring this infestation out. Here you can see 2021. This is uh, where a lot of the defoliation occurred. And um, since then, I think the populations have pretty much collapsed. And I'm wondering if we will be actually seeing a resurgence of the, of the spongy moth again. Um, further to the west, the front seems to keep moving to the west. It gradually crawls, uh, much as it first came through uh, the New York area. But you know, one of the most interesting things to me is that when it first came through, I didn't really see the defoliation on the conifers, uh, white pine and hemlock. Uh, but this time I did. And um, it, to me, it was a quite a revelation that even hemlocks that have been treated for the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, became fully defoliated. And once entirely defoliated, uh, they died. So in my mind, I sort of like have recalibrated uh, um, the impact of the spongy moth such that you know, if, if there are hemlocks that I see defoliated, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. They, they go, it's the only tree I know that's killed with just one year defoliation uh, of the spongy moth. 
So this is one insect that came through. It had a heavy impact um, and we're gonna be watching it. And you know, as climate changes, uh, as, as oaks perhaps become more common uh, in New York, we're gonna see uh, the scenario change over time. I don't know, but it's something that's not static, quite obviously. It didn't pass through and then disappear. It still has the propensity to pop back up again. Um, and so this is something that we'll be watching. Um, this is the gypsy moth, uh, spongy moth egg masses. Um, it's, uh, and one of the things that I tell people is that if you found yourself, uh, your area defoliated, be sure and go out and look for fresh egg masses um, in that winter so that you can evaluate whether or not you're gonna have another outbreak of this insect. And there's a lot of information on the uh, DEC website telling you how to actually sample these egg masses. Um, the, the next one that I wanna look at was actually first uh, discovered in, uh, in North America in 1890, and that's the uh, beech bark disease. Interestingly enough, that's an insect that came through um, at the same time uh, in, in the Finger Lakes area, as did the gypsy moth, spongy moth, oh boy. Um, this is a really interesting thing, actually. Um, the um, insect came from Europe, um, but actually it didn't, it wasn't the insect that kills the tree, it's the fungus uh, that kills the tree, the fungus that's introduced into the bark of the tree by the insect. You can look at it, you see this picture of the bark of, of, the, um, <clears throat> of a beech tree, those little white dots are actually little tiny scale insects with white, wool, white woolly waxy wool on them. And what they do is by inserting their mouth part into the bark of the tree, they create an infection court for the fungus that's always present on the tree uh, to get back to, to get into the bark and start feeding uh, on the bark, causing lesions and gradually killing the tree because the bark is destroyed. Uh, interestingly enough, um, it's not only an introduced fungus, but it's also a native fungus that's a problem with this. Um, the good thing is that <clears throat> research has shown that there's a, a slight amount of the population of beech that are resistant, and they've been, been persisting on the environment uh, and, and growing well. So now you don't see trees like this one uh, very often. Uh, but I can remember huge trees that were killed when it first came through. Um, but so we'll wait to see how this plays out. Uh, you know, it could be that the, the population of trees will gradually uh, shift over to the more resistant forms. But unfortunately, if you look at the bottom of the list, we have some bad players on the on coming up. Uh, and so the future of beach is a big question mark in my mind right now. Um, the next one I want to talk about, 1897, was the introduction of the brown tail moth uh, from Europe. And the brown tail moth, I'm bringing that up now uh, because you know, it's sort of, in the past few years, it hasn't been a big deal. But, I mean, the past few years, it has become a big deal. Whereas for a, a long time, it wasn't. 1897, the populations expanded. Uh, uh, the, the moth was, it can defoliate a lot of trees. It's, it, kill, it, it eats a lot of different trees, very, as we say, polyphagous. And um, the problem with this insect though, is not the fact that it goes, it goes epidemic and it kills uh, trees, um, but the problem with this is the hairs on their body, both the larvae and here you can see the hair covered egg mass. And if you look, this is a rash uh, that's generated by the hairs which are barbed and also have a poison in them that can get into your skin and create this rash. And it is a huge problem uh, because those hairs can remain active with that chemical in them for up to three years. And so the, the insect basically um, operates the, uh, uh, the larvae hatch in August and they start feeding on the upper side of the leaves and they actually live through the winter time and they form a, a, a cocoon-like, not a cocoon-like, a web-like mass, sort of like tent caterpillars. Um, and they spend the winter in that, in that, uh, in that um, tent. And then they emerge very early in the spring, ready to just chomp down on the early buds. And when they get to the early buds, that's really damaging for trees, deciduous trees. There's, there's two kinds of, of defoliators, those that go early in the season and they take those earliest leaves. And there's those that feed later in the season 
and they're the ones that feed later in the season, they're not really that big of a problem because the tree has already been able to generate a lot of photosynthates and store them in the roots of the tree. So they're not really heavily impacted, um, like the Bruce spanworm and, and uh, fall, fall webworm. Um, but there's these that go early in the season, like, like the spongy moth and the brown tail moth are a problem. Um, so the interesting story here is you can see when it first was introduced into the Boston area in 1897, it quickly spread. So by 1922, it had covered quite a large area. And then um, the maximum, oh, I'm sorry, the maximum extent was by, by 1914, just this huge area, all the way included uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, all the way into uh, the upper part of uh, New Hampshire and um, uh, Vermont. And then it collapsed, the population collapsed. So in 1922, it was smaller. And then uh, by 2000, by the early 2000s, it was focused here in the Casco Bay area and on the tip of Cape Cod. Uh, and the reason it did this, uh, the research has shown, is this insect right here, it's called Compsalura. It's a tachinid fly, it's a parasite that was introduced from Europe uh, to control the spongy moth. The problem with this insect, uh, and this is a good lesson, for non-native insect, for non-native uh, pest, is this parasite was introduced, but it's a generalist. It's not specific to, to, the, to the spongy moth or to the brown tail moth. And so its population we feel has been essential in taking down the population of the brown tail moth, but it was ineffective with the spongy moth. And even worse, because it's a generalist, it's gotten into some of the charismatic large moths like the luna moths and some of the cecropia moths and saturnids and uh, they feel that this insect is responsible for for really heavily impacting these really beautiful native moths that are out there so it's a it's a good warning signal uh, the problem is it's like research has shown that this insect was probably maintained in this coastal area um, by you know colder temperatures and moisture, um, but you know it's like I'm scratching my head. The populations in just in the past few years have really increased in the in the in the area of Maine. It's in the, just in, just in the past couple of years, it's become a huge problem. People raking their leaves in fall, uh, breathing in those hairs, uh, it can be a huge problem with the respiratory system. It's a, it's a public health hazard more so than, than a, a tree killing thing. And we just don't know what's going to happen with this. You know, why all of a sudden are the populations resurging? Is it something to do with the population dynamics of this predator that was released, Compsalura? Uh, we we just don't know. Uh, we need some more work on this. Uh, and this is this is a big warning thing. So anybody who's listening to this talk and you're going to uh, Maine to vacation uh, this summer, be aware. Uh, look for this. Look. Be aware that this insect is there. And, 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 and figure out what you can do to minimize your exposure because it's really serious. Um, of course, the next one I'm gonna look at is the chestnut blight. This is a pest, uh, uh, insect path, not insect path. This is a, a tree pathogen that was, that came from, uh, we think maybe the, uh, the Far East. And um, it was first found uh, in the uh, Bronx Botanical Garden in 1904 by a uh, pathologist uh, from the National Muse from the uh, Natural History Museum. And, um, and after 1904, it was only 50 years that it had taken down some of the most magnificent forests that were present in North America. Just an amazing wake-up call of what an introduced pest can do. Um, the good thing is that now we're looking at uh, the work of, uh, of uh, pathologists, primarily uh, the ones up in Syracuse have done a great job uh, genetically engineering um, <clears throat> uh, the trees so that they are resistant uh, the, uh, to the pest. And they're just introducing those trees onto, into the environment now. And I'm very hopeful that we will have this tree back uh, on the landscape because it was just so important. Uh, one of the interesting things though, I remember talking to a, a forest ecologist and, and he was, and uh, the psychologist was mentioning, well, you know, it's like, yes, chestnut was a huge part of the environment, but it was probably a huge part of the environment because it's actually sort of an invasive species itself. It reproduces by root shoots. And when you, when you cut it down, it doesn't go away, it stays there. So it might, 
the prominence of it on the landscape might have been in, indirectly a result of the manipulation of the environment by the early settlers chopping down the forests. Uh, but anyway, that's that's an aside. But you know, this one, you know, okay, we might have we might have survived this. It took a long time, and I do look forward to perhaps having chestnut back on the back on the landscape. The next one is is the focus of my research program right now, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I'm really hopeful that we can uh, uh, save the hemlocks before they disappear. The hemlock woolly adelgid, we figure it came from Japan in the early 1900s, introduced near Richmond, Virginia uh, in, a, in an arboretum. And it has just spread like wildfire once it got into the hemlock forest. I'm not gonna dig deeply into the life cycle other than say there's two generations a year that they're all females and each female will lay 100 eggs. So if you think about it, 100 squared eggs from one individual on a tree is a huge reproductive potential. And that's one of the huge problems that we're dealing with, the hemlock woolly adelgid. It feeds on the twig inside uh, on the xylem tissue, uh, the xylem ray parenchyma cells is what we call them. And by doing so, it causes the tree actually to react to the feeding by sort of by clogging up the conductive tissue. And by clogging up the conductive tissue, it isn't the needles that die, it's the growing tips, it's the buds that die first. And that's what kills the tree. It does not allow the tree to develop any more new needles. Um, and so basically uh, feeding kills the buds and it usually takes from four to 10 years. Although I've seen some sites, I think when you get on a real good site, it takes up to 20 years to kill a tree but they don't look very good after 20 years being infested. Um, you know, the uh, trees do respond uh, uh, to insecticides very well. And so if you do treat your trees, uh, you can evaluate the effectiveness of the insecticide by looking at these nice bright green buds that form. You can also evaluate the impact of the adelgid by going to look at your tree in the springtime. And if you don't see those bright green buds that are forming of the current year's growth, you know that you have a problem on your hands. Uh, so this is the current distribution of uh, HWA by town in New York. Uh, you can see the dark red are the recent discoveries. It seems to be spreading uh, pretty rapidly. It depends on the, on the winter though. If you had a hard winter, like actually, you know, this has been a really easy winter, right? Well, remember we had that one really hard freeze and it got down to, uh, got down to uh, minus 25 Celsius. And uh, we have mortality around the state of in the high 90s in, in most of the places. Uh, we do a overwintering mortality. You know, that's enough maybe to slow down the spread a little bit, but invariably it comes back and it, and it just, you know, even though areas that I've seen overwintering mortality of 99% having counted 500 or more of those uh, adelgids, they the populations still come back. So we're not stopping it. And indeed, think about it. If cold tolerance is a genetically linked trait, uh, then you get one survivor, they're all females, they're gonna reproduce, boom, you have a whole new population of uh, uh, cold resistant individuals. Uh, we, we've been looking at cold mortality at two sites, uh, Tagannock and Minekeel. Minekeel is cold. And we did record this mortality over time. But here you see the high 90s. It didn't seem to matter. The populations came right back. And then subsequent years of low uh, mortality, I mean, 60% mortality for an adelgid uh, two generations a year is nothing. Um, systemic insecticides, luckily, are effective. Um, you can go to our website, uh, NYS Hemlock Initiative. Info and we have a lot of information about it. We're lucky uh, because these insecticides will save these big trees. One treatment will last five years or more, or more. And so we can save these magnificent individuals and the genetic uh, uh, information that they represent uh, so that future generations uh, will not be impacted by a total loss of individuals. Um, we have predators. The one hope is that the predators will work. We have winter, winter spring feeders spring feeders and winter feeders. Um, what we need to do is work in concert on both generations. We're working with that. We're implementing it now in our lab, going to the Pacific Northwest to collect flies, the silver flies and the Laracobius beetles. And uh, recent research has shown that 
uh, it's the presence of these predators on the Pacific Northwest that actually uh, preserve the, uh, the hemlocks in the Pacific Northwest. It's a native insect in the Pacific Northwest. And when I grew up there, I didn't even learn about this insect as a pest. And I finally, I was introduced to it when I got to Cornell. And um, so our program is, uh, we have establishment of these insects. What we do need to, what we need to do is get the populations to grow more rapidly. Uh, this is another indication of just how they work. The beetles work on this first generation and the flies work in the second generation. So we need both generations to be impacted in order to, for uh, control of the adelgid. Um, and I'm not gonna get into this now, I don't have the time, but suffice it to say that this is the beetle, Laracobius. It's been worked on for a long time. It's been spreading throughout the areas that's been uh, released and uh, Hopefully the uh, the uh, the silver flies will follow. In New York, we've released um, almost thirty thousand uh, since two thousand eight. Uh, this is the silver fly. Uh, first, we first began releasing them in two thousand fifteen, really in earnest in two thousand seventeen, and since then uh, we've released over thirty, uh, almost you know, thirty three thousand uh, flies. Um, so it's going to take a while for the populations to build. That's the problem. Uh, you figure if you look at Adelgis, you look at a tree and there's a bazillion out there, or at least a few million, and we release a, a thousand flies or a thousand beetles. It's just, it's a numbers game. It takes time for the populations to build, and you need to have a lot of control to control an asexually reproducing insect. So current management issues, early detection is it. Um, we got to detect the predators early so we know how they're, what works and what doesn't. Uh, and we're using environmental DNA now to affect that. So it's a brand new technique. It's being, it's being actually, it's, it's growing rapidly because people realize how important and how, how easy it is to use, how important the data generated is. So um, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to be hopefully uh, having a lot more information on our work with the uh, Delgid predators. This is an insect elongate hemlock scale also introduced in the early 1900s, uh, first detected also in the Bronx Botanical Garden area. Um, it, it spreads much less rapidly than the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it's primarily found in the, uh, in the Hudson Valley uh, and it, uh, um, into the Berkshires. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that I've started seeing it not a few years ago, probably 15 years ago, I started seeing it um, in the Finger Lakes area. It also likes true fir trees. It gets carried around on nursery stock very easily. You know, hence I think, you know, the importance of phytosanitary regulation. Uh, this, we're not really sure that it kills trees, to be blunt with you. I'm, I'm, I haven't seen, I've seen equivocal evidence, uh, but you know, it's like, we're not really sure, but it, can't do any good for the tree. Um, and so with both the adelgid and the, uh, the scale, um, the poor hemlocks in the Hudson Valley don't look very good right now. Um, and we'll, we'll see. Um, it's, there are, there's a potential for a fungal pathogen and there's also a predator uh, that has been, uh, actually it's switched over from another uh, biocontrol program. And so I'm not really sure what to do with this, um, but it's there. And uh, it can be controlled with the use of an insecticide if you have it on your pet trees in your yard. Um, so now we jump to 1928, and this is an insect that really changed the face of our urban landscape more so than anything else. It's still in the natural landscape, the Dutch elm disease. This is, uh, Dutch elm disease is a fungus that's carried by a beetle. Um, and the beetle attacks the tree, it feeds on the tree to mature its ovaries. And in doing so, it introduces the fungus to the tree and the fungus grows rapidly and it clogs the conductive tissue. And by clogging the conductive tissue, it makes it more uh, uh, habitable by the, uh, by the beetles. And so the beetles then lay their eggs in that tissue and they become successful and they'll kill the tree rather rapidly. Um, so this is, it came in 1928 and boy, it had its way with the elm trees. I remember all the stories, uh, people, old timers in Ithaca telling me about all the beautiful elms that were on the art squad and how they just disappeared. 
And um, I remember colleagues in, at Penn State talking about how they're so proud that they're able to preserve uh, their elm trees <clears throat> um, using insecticides for years and years and years. Um, so, but you know, it's interesting on the, on the natural landscape. Um, I, I'm still puzzled by this one. I, I have elm trees on my property and I have some elm trees that are dead, some young ones. I have a beautiful one that's still alive. Um, I, I'm sort of puzzled why it, it hasn't succumbed yet. Um, why do some of them persist and others not? Um, one of the good things about elm is that it reproduces uh, rather early. Uh, so you can get a young tree reproducing. So that'll keep seed on the landscape and generating young trees. So it, we're not gonna see elms disappear anytime soon. Um, how Dutch elm disease, pl disease plays out, I don't know. There are resistant strains, cultivars being developed um, and we have resistant, seemingly resistant trees on the landscape. Uh, we just don't really know. But as you see at the very end, we have another pest of elm coming up, the elm zigzag sawfly. Um, and then we get to the balsam leodelgid. And actually, it's interesting, this is the bug that got me into the business as a young graduate student out in Washington State. It was killing my favorite stand of, of fir trees. Um, it loves to eat balsam fir and Fraser fir down in the Southern Appalachians have been have been decimated, uh, as well as the fir trees in uh, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> Just recently, we found in the past few years, we've seen mortality mounting uh, in the Adirondacks. And indeed, anywhere you go, you see pockets of uh, balsam fir. Um, in, in New York State, you'll see them here and there, you know, separated by miles. And invariably, every single one of those pockets of uh, balsam fir are impacted by the balsam leodelgid. Uh, some, there'll be some mortality. Um, but what I see happening with the balsam leodelgid, uh, having visited uh, Nova Scotia, some of those areas where it was first uh, found with balsam fir, it appears to kill the older trees. And so it, it, balsam fir can persist on the landscape as uh, a much younger forest uh, than in the good old days where you get older trees. Whether or not this will continue, I'm not sure. Uh, one thing about balsam leodelgid is that um, it appears to act differently between the different fir species. Here we only have balsam fir on the East Coast. On the West Coast, we have uh, five different species and it attacks them all differently. And the big question in my mind is, will the population of the adelgid change to overcome the resistance uh, that some of these species of fir have? And I don't really know. I think I might have seen that with it getting onto silver fir after it went through uh, alpine fir, but I don't really know. So this is still a situation that in my mind is evolving. And as, as is all these interactions of these introduced species, uh, we're, we're sitting here and we're watching. And the important thing is that we're aware that they're there. And so that if something does happen that uh, is an indicator of a big change, we're there and we're on it and we can, we can look at it and, and investigate it. Um, winter moth is another one of those insects similar to the spongy moth and the uh, uh, brown tail moth. Um, it was introduced prior to 1950. We're not really sure. It was, it was uh, it quickly expanded throughout the Maritimes um, and uh, down into Massachusetts um, and um, Cape Cod area. And um, it, it was, uh, inter uh, there was a fly introduced for its biological control. It was very successful uh, in controlling it. In fact, it's one of those textbook examples of the introduction of a, of a fly and uh, or of a predator, para predator, not, that's a, that would be considered a parasite, right? Uh, parasitoid and uh, having it eventually control the populations. And it worked so well, the populations collapsed and they really weren't a problem until just probably about 12 years ago, uh, it popped up again in the Massachusetts area, uh, Cape Cod area and started killing trees. And it was just really dramatic. I, I, I really, my heart goes out to the poor uh, oak trees in the Cape Cod area. It's first the spongy moth and then the winter moth. Um, the good thing is, is that the work of uh, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Joe Elkington at UMass Amherst, uh, he's showed, he demonstrated that 
um, this insect was controlled, he went out and got, uh, found that parasite again and reintroduced it and showed that yes, indeed, the parasite was able to kill the, uh, control the populations. So it's not a problem. One problem though that, that you know, it's like, there's always gotta be a caveat though, right? And so that is that the uh, winter moth actually has a very close relative called the Bruce spanworm. And the Bruce spanworm actually interbreeds with the winter moth. And so they have these hybrids. And what happens when you have these hybrids? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, they appear not to be as aggressive. And the interesting thing is that they actually, the winter moth uh, genes appear to get diluted the further uh, east or further west that you go in Massachusetts. So, uh, you know, basically, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're sort of out of danger with this insect further west in New York State. But, you know, there's always that nagging thing there. What, what is going on with that interbreeding in the populations? Will Bruce Spanworm, you know, get some gene that all of a sudden turns it more aggressive? Or will the climate change and something like, will that make it more aggressive? We don't really know. Uh, this is an insect that everybody was worried about all of a sudden introduced in 1987. Oh, by the way, let me draw a line right here. You see, above this point, those insects probably were, were all introduced. I think there's a good chance that they were all introduced prior to the implementation of phytosanitary regulations in 1919 by the United States. It was a big battle getting those regulations in place. But once they were in place, I think they did inhibit the importation of a lot of pests. Um, and so if you know, if we could draw a line right here, this one on the other hand, the brown spruce longhorn beetle was introduced into Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1987 and it was introduced into the container port. And it's so obvious they have these great pictures that I've seen my colleagues took of the dead spruce trees right next to the container port in Halifax. And so we were really worried about this when we first heard about it um, because spruce is huge. And you know something that kills spruce, that's, that gets our attention. And um, so there was a, a big effort in Canada watching it. And so it's, it's managed to get to uh, the middle of New Brunswick now, but this is an insect that doesn't appear to be aggressive any longer. For some reason, it looks it's behaving more like a native insect where it's going after weakened trees as opposed to being an aggressive killer of healthy trees. So we're not as worried about this anymore, but I wanted to bring it up uh, because this is the kind of situation that, you know, it could, we, we could have gone the other way and we'd be looking at another pest. Um, here we have the emerald ash borer. Uh, this is an insect and you probably have all been emerald ash borer to death. Uh, if you haven't heard a talk about this, I recommend getting on to uh, YouTube and looking at one of the 5 million that are out there. Um, basically this is, a, a, one year life cycle. This is a wood boring beetle. It gets in, it feeds on the phloem, kills the phloem of the tree uh, rapidly. And uh, the, the interesting story is, is how did it get introduced to the United States? And um, I was actually talking with an automotive engineer uh, after I gave a talk out in Niagara County. And, and he said, oh my good, my goodness, uh, I, I, I might've brought that in. Uh, because we were bringing in auto parts uh, into, he was an automotive engineer, worked all his life in Detroit. And he said, we started bringing in a lot of automotive parts in wooden crates uh, in the 90s. And we figured this was probably introduced in the late 90s, some, somewhere in the 90s into the Detroit area. And since then, it's just, it's been an absolute devastating fest of ash, of our ash forests. One year life cycle here, you can see all the different life forms. Um, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just been a, a game changer in the forests of New York because as you know, forests of New York have basically uh, uh, rebounded since they were what, uh, 100 years ago. There are far less forests in New York than there are now. And when, when forests, when they come back into uh, uh, forest fields, come back into forest, one of the prime characters coming in is the ash because the seed are, are so mobile. And they get in there and you'll have a forest of, of ash. So we have a disproportionately large amount of ash in New York State. So the emerald ash borer has been changing uh, the face of, 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 uh, of our forests and especially those forests associated with infrastructure because ash loves 
disturbed habitat? And what is human infrastructure if not disturbed habitat along roads, uh, power line, uh, uh, right ways, whatever. So it's really rubber hits the road when you consider that this is really an important impact on the human infrastructure. Ash trees next to houses. You can't live with an ash tree that's dead next to your house. It's going to fall down. You're, you, there's a problem with that. And that's what people have been, been voice, faced with is having to deal with dead trees. Um, this is just a map showing where it first came in. And indeed, this is a hitchhiker. These are all along the roadways uh, uh, and railroads, and uh, it's spread since then. So it's been, it's, uh, um, yeah, and it continues to spread, and it's not going to stop. Uh, the biological control of this has been, has been implemented, and it looks good, uh, promising. Uh, they put a lot of money into it, USDA, APHIS, PPQ. Uh, and, you know, it's like there's an egg parasitoid, and there's larval parasitoids. Uh, native biocontrols, uh, they, have, they have switched over, but aren't as, as uh, um, how do you say, uh, voracious as these imported ones. Um, and we just won't know. Uh, you know, it's like they're going to be there, and that's a necessary part uh, for the long-term control of this insect. Um, but, you know, in the short term, uh, we have pesticides, and luckily they work. And so I am, I am personally saving six trees on my property. Um, I'm treating them every three years. Uh, the insecticide is effective. It's not cheap, um, but I just want to have some ash trees around uh, for the long haul, and so I'm going to I'm going to do that. Um, so anyway, emerald ash borer, the definitely not done playing. That one is definitely not done playing out. Uh, there is a lot of work being put into looking at resistant trees right now. The Forest Service has a lab in Ohio looking at them, uh, and a lot of people around the United States are looking for what we call lingering ash trees that have survived uh, the, in, the onslaught of the emerald ash borer. Uh, so if you find an ash stand that has been decimated by the emerald ash borer and there's a, a live tree in there, we want to know about that. That's an important, that's a really important set of genes uh, that we can use to uh, reestablish ash on the landscape. The next Next one I'm going to look at is sudden oak death. And you mentioned oak wilt also, and I did not address that here, but I'll sort of do both at the same time. Um, so sudden oak death is an interesting disease. Uh, I remember uh, my major professor at Berkeley um, <clears throat> getting involved with this, as well as a fellow grad student of mine, a grad student friend. And we just didn't understand what was going on. Uh, this is after I left Berkeley. Uh, it started to get into the uh, tan oak forests in the coastal area. They finally discovered it was a, a, a fungal pathogen, uh, Phytophthora ramorum. Um, it's a devastating and a devastating pathogen, and it's like we don't really have a control for it right now. We're just sort of like spectators. But the one thing we can control is its movement, and we really need uh, regulation. I think of nursery stock. Uh, you know, one of the problems is I'll put this in in my rant. Uh, nobody knows where it came from. So if you don't know where it came from, it can't be a, a, a foreign pathogen, and therefore it sort of slips through the regulatory matrix. If it was something that came imported from someplace else, then there could be regulation put in place that would limit its movement. Right now, uh, there's no regulation in place, and, and my, my friend from grad school that's been working on this forever is frustrated as all get out that there is not regulation put in place primarily on the movement of nursery stock. That appears to be one of the prime areas of movement. So we're not done with this one yet. This one is on the landscape. It might show up on the East Coast, it might not. Um, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, the other, the oak wilt uh, is, is a disease, we call it the 4th of July disease of oak trees. And so if you see your oak tree all of a sudden turning uh, uh, the leaves turning a reddish brown uh, around the Fourth of July. You should your 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 warning. You should be excited about that because it could be a potential problem. It popped up on a Finger Lakes land trust property. Um, there are things that we can do to control it. The interesting thing is that we have no idea where this came from. The first reports of it uh, were just after World War II in Wisconsin, and um, it it has moved throughout the Midwest. Um, in, in pockets, and it's moved to New York. New York has been very aggressive 
uh, in their control of these pockets and admire that. I agree with that strategy. If we can limit its, its movement, uh, it will save our oak forests. Uh, it's transferred by uh, insects as well. And so this is one of the reasons that uh, the recommendation is if you're going to prune your oak trees, do it in winter, not in summer, because in summertime, they will attract the insects by, uh, by exuding the, when you, cut a, when you cut a tree in the summertime, you get that foamy uh, 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 stuff come out of the tree. That's what the insects feed on and that's what will transfer the disease. Asian longhorn beetle, this is one that scares the living daylights out of people because it likes sugar maples. It loves sugar maples. It likes a lot of different trees. It's quite prolific. Uh, indeed, a study done on the economics, in, potential economic impact of this insect uh, looked at it and said potentially $600 billion could be lost. That's just in the United States. It does not include Canada. It's a beautiful insect. It's a wood boring beetle. It lays its egg on the bark. It, the larvae bores into the tree and it can live in the same tree for years. Uh, it just it gets in there, it weakens the wood, the tree will gradually fall apart uh, and you know, that's, that's its impact. I imagine it impacts the flow of, of, uh, of sugar maple sap. Um, the interesting thing is it doesn't move very quickly and this is a, a map of the uh, infestations in the United States. There's been one in Toronto here uh, they were able to eradicate it. The thing about this insect is it's big um, and it moves slowly through a stand. And so the eradication efforts, I think, are justified. And they've eradicated in, uh, in Chicago. They've eradicated it in New Jersey and Manhattan. Uh, it's still extant here on Long Island. It's still up here in Worcester. And uh, we just got another infestation. It's still extant here in Ohio, and then we recently got an infestation here uh, in South Carolina, all associated with uh, you know, importation of wood from across from overseas. Um, so we're watching that one. Will it continue to be imported? Yes, it will. I think this points out the fact that we need strong regulation of, uh, of importation of materials in containers, um, and that's being worked on. One of the important things that's happened is that uh, there's uh, regulations being put on the use of wood packing materials and that such that it has to be treated, heat treated uh, before it can be used. And so it's just really coming into play right now. It's been more, it's been widely used. And I think that's an important step forward, but there's, as with anything human, uh, there, are, there have been problems with it and we just have to be diligent. This is thousand cankers disease was something that really scared the daylights out of us when it first came to our knowledge. Uh, it was, uh, here you can see this is the insect uh, beetle feeds on the tissue of the branches of the walnut trees, black walnut trees. It introduces a fungus, the fungus grows, it kills the phloem tissue and kills the tree really rapidly. It first became known in the uh, early, uh, well, mid-2000s, um, <clears throat> 2008, 2007, I think was the first time I heard about it. This is in Colorado, and they just rapidly declined. Here you can see the decline from June, uh, just over one year. Now, this is interesting because this is an insect that sort of defies uh, um, uh, our definition of invasive insects. If you consider the United States as a contiguous unit. If you consider the United States an amalgamation of different habitat types, then it is an invasive because this one apparently originated down in the uh, corner of New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Northern Mexico, where there's a, a shrubby uh, uh, walnut down there, and it's a native insect down there. And so it got imported up into uh, Colorado and spread uh, spread rapidly, and boy, was everybody worried about that. Uh, we were just, we were looking at the, uh, uh, here you see the it's death by a thousand cankers. We were looking at, at the eastern forests. Here you can see this is the green is the contiguous uh, distribution of, uh, of black walnut. And sure enough, it got introduced into Tennessee. It was discovered in Tennessee, then, then up in Virginia, then in Pennsylvania, and then it got here into uh, uh, Indiana. The interesting thing is that once it was introduced into the native range of black walnut, you know, we were worried. We were really worried, um, but it didn't do much of anything. And we think one of the primary reasons is that there are na native 
twig beetles, similar to those that are found down in this area. And they have their own natural enemies, their own natural control mechanisms. And so the twig beetles, when they got here into the native range of black walnut, apparently are overwhelmed by the natural enemies that were already there. And it has become a non-problem, which is really, really interesting. Um, so, but still keep your, keep your eyes open. Don't let that one come by. Here we have the spotted lanternfly. This is one that, boy, everybody is up in arms about. And guess why? because they like grapes. They just, they love grapes. They also like the tree of heaven. I've always found that to be a, a bit of a misnomer. I think it's the, the pest of heaven, uh, Elanthus species. Um, but it just, it has a fondness for grapes and it's just, is a huge impact. It was imported into the uh, area near Allentown, in Berks County, Pennsylvania on bluestone. It has egg masses sort of similar to those of the spongy moth. So it gets transported really rapidly uh, when you lays its egg on an automobile or whatever. It's just, it's gotten out of hand. First, it was first found around 2014, and now it's been found at a number of different places around New York State. Uh, the grape industry is really worried, as I would be. Uh, my recommendation is if, if I had a vineyard, I would cut down every single Alanthus tree out there um, because it seems to be that they, they do really well on Alanthus. Alanthus, has a really unique chemistry to it. Uh, they have been found to grow and uh, to adulthood and reproduce on other trees, but they're not as vigorous uh, on those other trees. So <clears throat> once again, this is an insect we didn't really know much about until 2014. Uh, needless to say, Penn State has been getting a lot of research funding and uh, there's a lot more information coming out about it. We will know a lot more in the coming years. Um, and uh, boy, this is this is a real scary one. Is it gonna impact the forests? I'm not really sure it's gonna be a huge impact in our native forests. You know, everybody was worried about sugar maple, of course. It appears to like the trees that move a lot of sap really fast, like silver maple, uh, maybe red maples as well, uh, and uh, black walnut, it also likes black walnut. Um, but we have not found mortality. I think they found mortality and black walnut that they can attribute to uh, spotted lantern fly, but I'm not sure about that. Um, so this is one that, boy, if you, you know, once again, there are a million and a half YouTube videos out there talking about spotted lantern fly. And if I had a vineyard, I'd be all over this. Um, I do have an orchard of apple trees. I am really worried about that, but apparently they are not a pest. Uh, it's native to uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, all over uh, Eastern Asia. And the interesting thing is that there are over 700 species in this family of the tree hoppers. Uh, 45 are in the genus, uh, but only the spotted lantern flies a pest. So the lesson from here, from this, is that basically, you know, we think we know what might be pests that we should pay attention to in the future. This one would have slipped through the radar because this is the only one that we know of that's a pest. So, but you know, luckily people are paying attention to what potential pests are, there are, where they get in and how they get in uh, to North America. So we're getting smarter. And, you know, this is, this is something that's really taken off. I think, you know, the idea of looking at uh, invasive uh, pests really is an idea that is born in the early eighties and has really become an important part of biology uh, in the 2000s. And so, you know, we're still young at the game here, but we're learning. Uh, beach leaf disease, this is another one. Boy, we wish we really knew where this came from. We have no idea. It popped up, I remember a few years ago at a scientific meeting I was attending and a pathologist got up and he said, this is a really weird thing. Number one, we don't know what the heck causes this. And number two, we don't know where it came from, but it's causing beach mortality. And this, this is a pathologist uh, from Ohio. <clears throat> and, um, and so we've watched it gradually increase and spread rapidly. It spread all the way from Ohio and they found it in Westchester County. We're finding it uh, basically popping up all over the place. We don't know how it gets around. Now we think we have a causative agent to look at and that's a nematode. Uh, but it could be a nematode in combination with a fungus um, that gets in there. You can see it causes the dark 
uh, the dark areas on these leaves. Very easy to see when you're looking through a canopy in the summertime. Uh, so this is one that we need to be aware of. Uh, what do we do? I don't know. DEC went out and they tried uh, cutting an area. They found a small infestation of this and they tried uh, some, some silvicultural treatments to try and limit its spread, uh, but it was unsuccessful. Basically, it's like they were cutting a hole in a donut. Um, so I don't know. I wish I had more to say about this. Uh, you know, of course, there's more you can say. But the most important thing is that everybody becomes aware of it. Um, and could be some new stuff later. Okay, and yet another beach, poor beach. I, I just, I'm feeling really sad about beech trees. This is a, an insect that was imported from Europe, once again, into the Halifax, Nova Scotia area. And I remember being up there uh, just a couple of years after they, they first started seeing it. And boy, this kills trees. Um, and it's been spreading rapidly uh, from, Nova, from Halifax. I was down about 100 miles south of Halifax and it was really beginning to spread rapidly down there. Um, it can be controlled with chemicals, um, but it's like how many beach are out there? And you know, it's like you can maybe control it on your pet tree, um, but this is a really, it's, it's a small uh, chrysomelid beetle that gets in there and feeds as a larvae um, on the leaves and kills, kills the leaves and gradually starves the tree. This is one that's not here yet, um, but I'm waiting for it. It's something that should be on the radar. Um, and then we finally have the Ohm zigzag sawfly. This is an interesting insect. Um, it comes from uh, Eastern Asia, um, and it was found a few years ago in, um, in Europe. And uh, they found that it basically, uh, it feeds on every single kind of elm out there. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see it has this characteristic zigzag feeding pattern there. Um, here's another, another uh, picture of the, of the feeding pattern, <clears throat> native to Eastern Asia. Uh, yeah, introduced to Eastern Europe in 2003 and the dispersal is huge estimated to be 90 kilometers per year. That's really fast. And uh, the first time it was found it was uh, in North America it was near Montreal in 2020. And it wasn't very far from, far from Montreal. And then a survey done in 2021 found it 125 miles upstream along the St. Lawrence. It's now found in New York. Um, it's spreading much more widely. Uh, an interesting thing is that this happens to be the place in New York State where we have perhaps the most elm uh, in those wetlands surrounding the St. Lawrence Seaway. So uh, this is another one. Uh, we're just going to have to watch and see what's happening. Uh, it kills trees in Europe. Will it kill trees here? Uh, I, I would expect that it could do that. Everywhere would it kill them? I don't know. Uh, what's going to happen when it interacts with uh, Dutch elm disease? Um, so this is something that here it is. It's here, folks. Um, poor elms, poor beaches. Um, so the inter uh, there it is. There's a picture of one. They are rather cute, by the way. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that I think about them, uh, when I think about uh, invasive insects and, and what's happening with client change, climate change, is you know. So what is what are we looking at? Uh, what are we going to be looking at over time? So this is. This is like a hypothetical habitat thing. This is so. This is where, say, your 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 hypothetical tree is most happy between this latitude and this longitude. You be it, you know, whatever it is, you know, a, a moisture matrix or whatever. But say this is where it's happy, and this is where it is now. What climate change is going to do? It's going to shift that happy zone. And um, when you have that happy zone, you're going to have colonization. And uh, they're going to have an area where it's going to overlap, where you're going to have the normal habitat, the happy zone. But then you're going to have this area here where it's stressed. And my question is, what's that going to do to our forests, especially when considering some of the native insects that we have who have been in happy uh, coexistence with the trees, maybe not so happy all the time. Um, I grew up working with bark beetles out west. And they caused huge, prob huge problems out west, but that's not entirely because of climate change. It's also uh, management, forest management practices, the suppression of fire uh, that keeps the population of trees 
uh, older than they would be. And older pine trees are more susceptible than younger pine trees. But then, you know, I get down, I, I was down visiting, uh, um, oh, then we have Southern Pine Beetle on Long Island. You know, what's happening with the Southern Pine Beetle, the native insect, it's killing all sorts of pines on Long Island. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's, they're gonna be stressed. They're on, they're on a sandy soil type. I think you know, New York State DEC has done a masterful job of managing this, much the way that it's managed in the South, where you go in, you take out susceptible individuals so that, they, so that the population of beetles can't grow to the point to where they're attacking uh, uh, healthy individuals. Uh, and then that's, that's the way you control it. But will that change with climate time? Climate change, will that change when, when, the, when they get stressed? Um, I was also, you know, this is where Southern Pine Beetle is in Long Island, and it's moving up. I heard that the Southern Pine Beetle now has moved up into the Hudson Valley and has been caught on traps near Albany. Um, so, and I was also down in Texas not too long ago. Oops, I've gone over, I'm sorry. And I saw trees that were, uh, that were killed, big, huge, beautiful trees. Uh, some of the live oaks killed by ambrosia beetles um, in areas where they have been stressed by the drought. So I've seen evidence that, that this is at play right now, native insects taking out uh, stressed trees, but will this become a much more common thing? I don't really know. So I'll, I'll leave that thought with you. Um, there's my contact information if you have questions. And uh, I didn't put my website up there. If you, if you Google, I'm sure, New York and Hemlock, uh, my organization will come up. Uh, in the search. Uh, um, so um, I am all ears for questions at this time. Thank you, Mark. Um, there actually is a, one question already. Um, and I think this is going back to um, the part about the emerald ash borer. Um, why have the forest rebounded just in the last 100 years? Oh, it's because uh, we, we cut them. And so it's like a lot of this land was, was cleared. Indeed, I have 22 acres of property and um, two thirds of my property has come back into forest uh, just in, since uh, 1938. So the forests in New York are relatively young uh, in areas where they've been cleared. Um, so that's, that's why, that's why we have so much ash on the landscape. Ash is not an old forest tree, it's a young forest tree. Um, no more questions? I should be more controversial. <laughs> um, would an increased bird population forestall the growth of any of these forest pests and their larvae? So if so, are there specific birds versus specific pests? Um, I, I don't, you know, it's like, um, I think there's a, there's a, a problem uh, with birds. I mean, sure, we have the cuckoos that love to come and feed on the forest tent caterpillars. Are they responsible for the collapse of the native forest tent caterpillar populations? No, I don't think so. I think bug populations have a propensity to grow far faster than the, than the uh, uh, appetite or the population growth also um, of predatory insect or predatory birds. Uh, another, uh, for instance, um, there's work done, I'm an expert on bark beetles out west. Um, I don't know, there's some work that's done with emerald ash borer and woodpeckers and where uh, they use data generated by the lab of O to see that there was a population response by the downy woodpeckers, um, uh, as, uh, but not the hairy woodpeckers. Now, if you're familiar with woodpeckers, the downy woodpecker is, is not an obligate feeder on, on, on bugs that eat trees. Uh, they'll eat a lot of different things, whereas the hairy woodpecker is an obligate feeder on tree inhabiting inse insect, uh, bark boring insects. And so the hairy woodpeckers uh, and, uh, don't respond. And this is uh, borne out by insect, by work on the West Coast the, in bark beetle epidemics that shows that the downy woodpecker populations did respond, but hairy woodpeckers did not because the hairy woodpeckers, if they did, 
there would be a huge population collapse because the superabundance of food would disappear when the host trees were killed. And so they would be sitting there with a huge population out there. So they would go through a population collapse. And it's actually disadvantageous to stable, resilient populations to go through those huge up and downs. Whereas the downy woodpeckers, on the other hand, could respond uh, to this abundance of this higher population level by exploiting other food sources that are present. Now, does this play out in, with all birds? You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I have yet to see evidence uh, um, in any of these systems of the invasive insects where they've shown that the birds are a significant impact to the population growth. Okay. Um... What's the process for figuring out if a new biocontrol can be released safely? Ah, that's my job. <laughs> and you know, it, it's it's uh, you know, I brought up that Comsalura for a reason. Um, it's not just anybody who can go out there and think that they can find a bug and introduce it. Indeed, there have been many mistakes, like Comsalura. Uh, that's a huge mistake. Taking out some of the most beautiful, charismatic. Uh, moths that we have in North America uh, by the introduction, by the unthoughtful introduction of this insect was just, it's just, that's a travesty. Uh, and I have, I have friends that uh, are lepidopterists that are really pissed off. Uh, but anyway, the, the important thing is that uh, we evaluate very carefully and use only those insects that are specialists. They feed only on the prey uh, that we're targeting. And you know, I could I could spend hours going into the process that we use, but suffice it to say, it's heavily regulated, quite rightly so. It's self-regulated as well as regulated by USDA APHIS PPQ. We have to apply for permit to release any insect, and we have to have a lot of data to back it up. So its biological control has become a highly regulated and quite rightly so uh, profession. Um, so that's the short answer. Okay, the dates of introduction seem to show an acceleration of introduced invasives. Is this a result of globalization or are we looking harder? Yes and yes. I, I think that uh, globalization obviously uh, has, be, has, has a huge impact because I mean, just look at, uh, I mean, there's been work done on the number of bugs that are found in each container that comes over. It's like the USDA does an inspection every once in a while just to see how you know what they're dealing with, and they find just an amazing amount of insects in each container. Uh, the question is, you know, we're not going to change. Uh, I don't. I don't think anybody's going to you know say, oh, well, let's just stop globalizing. That's not going to happen. But what we have to do is we have to get smart about it and implement. Uh, you know, regulation uh, that is necessary to minimize uh, the introduction of, of new pests. And I think, you know, one of the reasons also that we're seeing it more recently is that we're seeing more of these uh, uh, bark inhabiting uh, beetles. And those are really tree killers. Those are the really big ones. You know, some of these defoliators, you know, like the brown tail moth, you know, it, it doesn't really kill a lot of trees. And now really the spongy moth that comes through, it doesn't really kill a lot of trees, but you get the emerald ash borer out there uh, and it's huge. Um, so I think we might be seeing more, more of those insects that are carried over in wood shipping containers as being the problem. Okay, when pesticides are recommended, have they been tested for impact on the on general forest ecology? Or yes, they, yes, there's a lot of work on, on the use of insecticides in the forests. Whoops, did I just, I just killed the slideshow, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, yes, I mean, it's like, we don't just go out there and do that. Um, but I think that there's a really important thing to consider. Um, it's sort of like, like for instance, with hemlocks. Um, yes, there is an impact. We use systemic insecticides, and they kill insects that feed on the tree itself. Um, however, what we're dealing with is a tree that is a foundation species. 
for a myriad of other species, not only the bugs that feed on the tree, which would die if the tree died by the hemlock woolly adelgid, but we also have all the mammals, the birds that need the habitat, uh, especially in the winter time. And to lose a foundation species like that uh, radically changes the environment. And so, you know, it's like uh, the, the impact of killing a few bugs that feed on the tree itself uh, is nothing compared to the impact of losing the tree itself. Um, so, you know, that's just one instance. It's like, we don't do this blindly. It isn't like, you know, it's like, oh, it's Tuesday. It's time to go out there and spray our soybean crop. Uh, that doesn't happen in the forest environment anymore. Uh, it's really, there's you know, a lot of really good people working on this. And you've got to consider the long-term impacts of the potential loss of a species. I mean, when, we, when, I, when I first started grad school, I would never would have thought that we'd be dealing with the potential of losing a whole species of trees just because of an insect that came in. That just wasn't a part of the lexicon, but now it is. Um, I had earlier heard that the colder climate in our Finger Lakes area retarded the spread of HWA. Is this still the prevalent thought? No, not at all. No, hemlock woolly adelgid will march through here. It's like I mentioned, the population growth, potential for population growth in the hemlock woolly adelgid is astronomical. Um, it's, you know, it's asexually reproducing two generations a year, 100 eggs for each individual. Uh, it's just, it's huge. And so even if you get 99.9% .9 control with the cold weather, um, it's, it's, it's not gonna stop the population. It's gonna be there and it will continue to grow. Um, the thing is, is that that also forces genetic change in the population. And so that if you have uh, an adelgid that has mutated to become resistant, uh, to the impacts of cold weather, um, then you have a whole nother population that's developing. And so we are gonna see, I think, the gradual movement uh, of this insect into colder areas where it hasn't been before. But I think that, you know, it's also, it's a part of, of genetic change, um, as well as just the fact that they've never been there before. Um, and I got to add in this, uh, so when I first started working on balsam woolly adelgid, a very similar insect to the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, Everyone that, quote unquote, was an expert on the topic said that it would never move out of the coastal areas uh, because it was susceptible to cold temperatures. Now we find it near tree line on Mount Washington. We find it near Yellowstone Park. I mean, this is, it's moved into cold areas. There's no question about it. And I don't expect Hemlock Woolly Adelgia to be anything different from what we've seen with the Balsam Woolly Adelgia. Uh, okay, pardon me if this is not related enough, but I am wondering who I can contact about native plant ordinances in New York State, specifically wanting to encourage funding and education about establishing, excuse me, ex establishing native plants in newly built communities, as well as eradicating invasive species from being sold in nurseries. Uh, that is not my thing. I'm sorry. Um... Ag and markets perhaps might have something to do with that. There's a, it's a, it's a huge topic. And I think it's really important. Uh, glad to hear somebody's aware of it and bringing it up. Uh, Chris might actually have a better idea of how to address that question rather than I. Yeah, I think uh, that would be a topic for a whole nother presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Absolutely, a good topic too. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, uh, next question. I'm in Minnesota, Cornell alum, New York State native. Lots of oaks here and oak wilt. Drought and plowing treatment weaken red oaks and native. Oh, I think this is more. Oh, no, it's a question. Sorry. Drought and plowing treatment weaken red oaks and native two line chestnut borers. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing anything. Find these trees, and sometimes it's hard to tell. If if the oaks die from oak wilt or borers. Are these borers present in New York? Also, yeah, two, the two-line chestnut borer is present everywhere where, where uh, oaks are. It's, it's, it's a native insect. Once again, it operates like a native insect, taking out in, uh, weakened individuals. Um, I, you know, I, I have never seen it be 
really aggressive, but I'm not going to say never uh, uh, in the, for the future because you know we're we're looking at climate change. Who knows what's going to happen uh, with climate change? I do know that the oaks are going to be uh, what we're going to be seeing more commonly uh, surviving in New York. They're going to be much more comfortable. Um, but I don't know the interaction with oak wilt uh, and oaks and uh, two line chestnut borer. That's an interesting situation. It's something that I would expect to occur. You get a tree weakened the, uh, by the uh, oak wilt. <laughs> um, but oak wilt is a very fast operating uh, uh, pathogen. And you know, my guess is that it would take a while for the chestnut, uh, two line chestnut borer populations to build. What we find here in New York right now with hemlocks is that trees that are weakened by the hemlock woolly adelgid are being killed by the, I think they're being killed by the uh, hemlock borer before they are finally finished off by the hemlock woolly adelgid. But, you know, it's sort of like uh, the chicken and the egg kind of thing uh, when it comes to that. So hopefully we're, we have a student interested in looking at this and hopefully we'll at least get some indicators uh, as to how aggressive the hemlock borer is. Um, so no, thank you for bringing up that system. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting system and one that's uh, currently got my, got my attention. Um, okay, is there a cheat sheet anywhere on Cornell's website with invasive pests to look out for in our local forests? Hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that uh, that's, that's an interesting topic. I, you know, I, you could look at this seminar again and you could see the, the rogues gallery uh, that's there. Um, I would, I would use that list, you know, basically right now we have, you know, on our doorstep, we have the uh, beech leaf disease. We have the uh, uh, elm zigzag leaf beetle. Uh, we have the beech uh, leaf mining beetle. Uh, those, are, those are things that could be here soon, uh, as well as the old favorites, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, emerald ash borer, and heaven forbid we get the uh, 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 Asian longhorn beetle. Um, so, you know, that, that's the short list right there. I, I hope you had your pen and paper ready. If not, go look at this presentation again with that list. I'm sorry, I can't be of greater help for you. Edie, will this, um, the recording of this presentation will be on our website, I assume, right? Yep, probably by, I would say, Monday or Tuesday of next week, and also on our YouTube channel. <laughs> right. Mark, I can't thank you enough for all the information you've uh, provided with everyone tonight. It's um, really incredible. Uh, how much you know, how much you're willing to share with us, and how much we all need to pay attention to. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot, and it's important. Um, we appreciate it very much. Thank you.